Without further ado, Chief Mandela. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, my dear brothers and sisters, I greet you this evening in the universal greetings of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be upon you all. It is indeed an honor for me to address you this evening during this August occasion in which we gather on an issue that my grandfather, President Nelson Kholitlatla Mandel, regarded, and I quote, the greatest moral issue of our time, close quote. I can assure you that when he uttered those words, he meant every word he said. Those words are as true today, if not more so than when he first uttered them. So allow me to express my gratitude and appreciation for the courageous stand that AMP and you are taking. We gather at a time when many would prefer to be speaking in harsh tones about such a critical issue. There are many today who prefer that we remain silent, and my wife, always says, as we pursue Madiba's legacy, we should always ensure that we continue to advocate what he championed while he lived. That would not only be a travesty for us to remain silent, in the adverse of justice, but it would be out of character as a community of conscious, a global community deeply rooted in our commitment to human dignity, justice, and peace. In the face of injustice, we are duty bound to be the voices for the oppressed, defenseless, and of millions of suffering wherever they may be. The struggle for Palestine is first and foremost a humanitarian issue, as more than seven decades of occupation has inflicted untold hardships on innocent men, women, and innocent children. The Palestinian struggle is no less than a genocide perpetrated in the full glare of a largely silent world. This is an untenable situation and one which perpetuates by not mobilizing global opinion against apartheid Israel. In the face of this catastrophe, we have a global machinery spreading lies, deceit, and misinformation on a colossal scale. Events such as this arranged by AMP plays a crucial role in building an effective counter to such a propaganda. 
I would like to address you this evening on a few critical issues which I believe is necessary for us as a collective in order to be effective in mobilizing for the Palestinian cause. I would also like to share some lessons from our very own South African struggle for liberation's experience as we often refer to the twin apartheid of South Africa and Israel. Finally, we would like to consider how we view the solutions before us vis-a-vis a one or two-state solution. My dear brothers and sisters, my respected elders, it is vital that we do not construe the Palestinian struggle as solely a Muslim struggle, as this is factually incorrect and tactically does the cause a grave in disservice. Notwithstanding the status of the Palestinian and the specifically Al-Quds as the third most sacred sanctuary in Islam and our first Qibla and site of accession of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Historically, Palestine has been a home to Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and we all fought side by side against the Zionist occupation and creation of Israel as a land without people for a people without a land. To this day, Jews, Christians, and Muslims oppose the perpetuation of this lie. There is a more fundamental issue, though, that is that the Israeli occupation and its unending atrocities is first and foremost a crime against humanity that requires every freedom-loving individual in the world to stand side by side and demand an end to the illegal and unjust occupation of Palestine. <laughs> Apartheid Israel's brutality has known no limits. Thousands of political prisoners remain in, in incarceration and suffer brutal torture and inhumane treatment. It is in that regard that today I walk around with a key in my suit as an indication for what my grandfather dedicated 27 years of his life as a prisoner in apartheid, brutal jails. And for every Palestinian that lingers in Israeli jails, we as the Mandela family pay tribute to those heroes and heroines of the Palestinian struggle. Where else in the world are youth, some often found as young as 12 years old, imprisoned, interrogated, and abused, yet this totally escapes our mainstream media. Elderly women and men suffer daily humiliation at the hands of IDF soldiers at checkpoints and crossings, which in October 2017, I had to witness with my own eyes when I visited Palestine. Such injustices meted out daily on men and women through these checkpoints and crossings often never make any headlines anywhere else in the world. Palestinians are not only stripped of their dignity, they are robbed of their land and positions 
in ever-expanding illegal apartment settlements that continue unabated despite every UN resolution condemning the expansion. Today, less than 12% of historic Palestine is under the authority of the state of Palestine, and yet the occupation is ever expanding. Today, the expansion of illegal settlements on the outskirts of Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Palestine, is eroding the territorial integrity of the West Bank and usurping vast swaths of land. I will come back to this point later. In view of these and other atrocities, it is easy to grow beaten, lose hope, or be disheartened. I would like to share with you this evening the fact that our own struggle for the freedom in South Africa followed a similar trajectory. With the passing of the notorious Native Land Act of 1913, the vast majority of our people were forced into 13% of land of their, of their forefathers, suffering immense trauma and disposition, humiliation, and a gross violation of their human rights. Pixli Kaseme described it, I quote, overnight the native became a foreigner in the land of his birth, close quote. Today, there are more than six million Palestinians in the diaspora, most of whom have been denied the right of return in the land of their forefathers. For many, their plight might seem hopeless and a cause of despair. However, today, as South Africans, we can celebrate 25 years of democracy as we have overcome 350 years of colonialism, occupation, and six decades of brutal apartheid terror. We must never be cowed by the seemingly impossible task of overcoming the unjust occupation of the Palestinian people. Regardless of how bleak the outlook might appear at this moment. So the first lesson that we would like to offer and share with you this evening from our very own South African experience is that we should never lose hope. The second and equally important lesson is that we had to learn the very hard way. The South African regime, following the arrest of our struggle leaders in the early 1960s, became increasingly brutal, forcing many of our cadres into exile. Many were hunted, maimed, and killed by the apartheid regime, but the ever-growing contact with the outside world gave birth to what we today can call the global anti-apartheid movement. Through leveraging their presence everywhere they found themselves, they were able to build networks of resistance, solidarity, and mobilization. The global anti-apartheid movement played a seminal role in raising global awareness and support for our struggle for liberation. This saw a level of mobilization in the global forums on an unprecedented scale. My appeal to all of you this evening gathered here is to join hands with the six million Palestinians refugees living in exile and once again build an alliance of conscience that will immensely contribute to the ending the occupation and bringing about 
a lasting solution. One of the fundamental tasks of global anti-apartheid movement was to isolate the South African regime and its lackeys. This was no easy task, but in many places, it started with ordinary harbor workers refusing to handle the fresh produce that was coming from South Africa. Today, in my view, the most formidable development in decades in the Palestinian struggle has been the formation of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. <laughs> BDS movement that has seen such a groundswell of support for the Palestinian cause on a global scale that the, the apartheid Israeli regime is doing all its might to stem the tide of such a tsunami. Not only has BDS succeeded in advancing the call to isolate the apartheid regime in occupied Palestine, it has played an immensely profound role in raising awareness and building a nonpartisan front that can finally unite our desperate efforts. I therefore urge you, my brothers and sisters, to continue supporting the call of BDS until apartheid Israel and its illegal occupation is brought to an end. <laughs> this will require much hard work and an unfailing commitment to what my grandfather, President Mandela, described as, I quote, our freedom is yet incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people, close quote. <laughs> I would therefore be failing in my duty if I didn't pay tribute to the brave women and men of the civil rights movement here in the United States of America who supported our struggle to the hilt despite the Ronald Reagan administration's blatant and open support for the apartheid regime in South Africa. I have no doubt that you and other Americans would follow suit and walk in the footsteps of your brave predecessors. During the Cold War era, the United States government not only supported the apartheid state in its war on our people, it was also complicit in my grandfather's arrest on the 5th of August in 1962 in a small town of Hawick, just outside Peter Maritzburg. It was only in 2016 that former USA Vice Consul and covert CIA operative Donald Rickard admitted his role in Madiba's arrest in 1962, which robbed us as a family from having a husband, a father, and to us grandchildren, a grandfather. My dear brothers and sisters, my respected elders, you have an added responsibility, especially in this time when there is no honest broker for peace, neither in the White House nor in the Middle East region. I believe President Trump has made it abundantly clear where he stands on the issue of Palestine. His unitarian declaration of Jerusalem as a capital of apartheid Israel is not only partisan, it is illegal and a gross violation of international law. It is a violation that in, 
It is a violation of international law, including countless UN resolutions. As for the Gulf, it appears that they have fully bought into the hoax of the century and are sold on normalization of relations with apartheid Israel. This is neither in their interest given the, the Zionist vision of greater Israel, nor is it morally defensible given apartheid Israel's history of brutal occupation. This brings me to the question of a future settlement. Many may ask us if such a settlement is even possible. From our own experience in South Africa, I can tell you that many thought it highly unlikely given the highly unequal balance of power. However, we always cherished the dream of freedom in our lifetime. And I am sure that the Palestinians do too. Madiba was offered to be released from prison on two occasions. Firstly, he was offered to be released on condition that he returned to a Bantu stand known as the Transkai, which is his birthplace. He rejected this offer outright. Secondly, he was offered again to be released on condition that he should return to his house in Soweto. He rejected this too. President Mandela was very clear that negotiations was only possible if there were three clear conditions met. The first condition he laid out in order for us to have negotiations, he demanded the release of all political prisoners, as he is famously quoted as saying that only free men can negotiate. Secondly, he demanded the unbanning of all political parties and movements located in the Republic of South Africa. Thirdly, he demanded the right of return of all South Africans living in exile. There is no reason why the Palestinians should settle for anything less than that. For us, the reality is that we never accepted a Bantu stand solution for ourselves in South Africa. And therefore, we should never accept such a solution for the Palestinian people. Yeah. Apartheid Israel, through its occupation, and continued expansion of illegal settlements has made the two-state solution inconceivable. In fact, it may now be argued that apartheid Israel never had any intention of a two-state solution. We have a moral responsibility to ensure that the Palestinian cause is not muffled in the USA or anywhere else in the world. To many young Palestinians show us daily that they are fearless and brave in the face of apartheid Israel's brutality. We dare not betray their trust and confidence. Today, as a Muslim community in the USA, you are duty bound to join people of other faiths, political persuasions, and social movements to form the largest possible social lobby in support of the Palestinian cause. I have no doubt, my respected brothers and sisters, that this is indeed possible, for in doing so, you assert your own fundamental human rights and advance the recognition of your contribution to building peace in the world and in America that is truly brave and free. I thank you.